Hi, I'm Konstantin Baum, Master of Wine, and today I'm going to focus on one of the most controversial wine categories in the world. Some call them the only real wines, while others argue that they are flawed. I will give you my thoughts on natural wines, and we're going to taste some well-known examples from that category. So let's do this. <music> Everything that was required to make fermented grape juice was present in nature before humans walked the earth. But if it was up to nature alone, wine would not exist. Before us, there were only rotten grapes. Therefore, wine is not a natural product, it's a cultural product as it requires human intervention to make wine. So right from the start, the term natural wine is a bit misleading. I think the more appropriate term would be low intervention wine. While I like the idea behind natural wines, enjoy many of these wines, and do think that natural wines make the wine world a more exciting place. I also think that the natural wine movement is often plagued by dogma and that they don't always live up to their own standards. But let's talk about the definition first. What is natural wine? Raw Wines, the self-described world's largest community of natural, organic and biodynamic winemakers, defines it as follows. Wine that is farmed organically and made without adding or removing anything in the cellar. This is a pretty clear-cut definition and I think this clear message has contributed significantly to the success of the natural wine movement. But as ever so often it gets more complicated if you read the fine print. Raw wines requires their producers to farm their vineyards organically, but many natural wine producers are not certified organic, which makes it difficult to tell who is actually walking the walk. Raw wine also allows producers to use fining and filtration and you can even chaptalize or acidify in an exceptional year. I always thought that it was not possible to add cultured yeast to a natural wine, but you can actually use cultured yeast if you are making a sparkling wine. While some natural wine producers do not add any sulfites to their wine, most of them actually do, and the maximum level of SO2 in a wine for raw wines is 70 mg per liter, which is only roughly half or a third of what you are allowed to add in a conventional white or red wine. It is therefore not as clear cut as the natural wine movement sometimes would suggest they are allowed to add or remove things to or from their wine. Overall, I do not really care how natural a wine is. I do care though whether a wine is organically made from a small producer and made in a low intervention way. I do also care about the fact whether a wine is flawed and for a long period natural wines often contained flaws. The main reason for that was the absence of sulfites. Sulfites are an important tool in winemaking as they protect the wine from oxidation and microbial spoilage. They've been used in winemaking for thousands of years and they are also used to conserve dried fruit, vegetables, fish and meat for example. While only a tiny percentage of the population is allergic to sulfites, they got a bad reputation because people were blaming their hangovers on them. But has anybody ever had a hangover after eating a whole can of dried plums? Let's see whether I get a hangover after drinking vast amount of natural wine. Let's taste. The first wine I'm going to taste is the 2019 Envinante Taganan from Tenerife that retails for 20 US dollars. All of the wines that I'm going to taste today were selected by Leon the intern and he's quite a natural wine buff so I'm looking forward to tasting through his selection. The first thing I gotta mention is the wax capsule on this wine. I do like wax capsules and they seem to be used quite frequently in natural wine production. They can be a bit of a pain to open so I usually just puncture the cork through the capsule through the wax and then just pull the cork out like this. The only thing that happens then is that you have some wax up here and some of it might get into the wine so you can scrape that off a little bit with the little knife on your corkscrew or you just leave it. Tenerife is the largest of the Canary Islands and this wine was called Taganan after a local name for those rugged vineyards on volcanic soil where those grapes were sourced from. This wine spent eight months in stainless steel and neutral oak vessels so it shouldn't be like oaky it should be more fine and elegant okay if you look at the color straight away you can see that there's something different going on there this is not light yellow and this is a dark golden color and this suggests that they used little sulfur and indeed they did use very low levels of sulfur. The grape varieties here are Listan Blanco, Malvasia, Mamugelo, Albio and Gual. But I don't think that this is necessarily super important in this case. This is more 
a total stylistic expression rather than a specific expression of different grape varieties, I think. The wine smells super interesting. This is not what you would expect if you're used to drinking fruity white wines. It smells of bruised apple, raisins, coffee, toffee, some really wild flavors coming together here. On the palate, it's very fresh and vibrant. The acidity is sharp. There's good length, quite a bit of body as well. So this is complete, but definitely not your usual white wine. But I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. It's just made in a different way and expresses the idea of the winemaker in a very good way. I would actually rate this wine quite high. I think this is a 92 point wine on my scale. The next one is the 2020 Matassa Cuvier Alexandria that retails for 30 US dollars. This wine was made by a biodynamic producer that didn't add any sulfites to the wine. They're still not allowed to write no sulfites on the label because sulfites are always part of the winemaking process as they develop naturally. Instead, they write no added sulfites or sans sulfite ajouté. This is quite an interesting project by a master of wine and somebody else. They purchased a vineyard in Roussillon at a fairly high altitude and they're making some interesting wines from there. This is their Muscat de Alexandria, a grape variety that is quite aromatic and quite interesting, especially when it comes from higher altitudes. This is actually an orange wine, so they just crushed the bunches and then left the grape skins in contact with the juice for one to two weeks. This changes the flavor profile of the wine completely. It also changes the color and the taste of the wine. So this should be exciting. Let's pour it. Just looking at it, you can see that this is a very different wine. It's quite golden in color, but it's also pretty cloudy. It didn't fine or filter it, so you can see little bits and pieces flying around in the glass. Oh, this is good. It smells very intense, but it's not overly flowery. It has some exotic flavors there. There's a little bit of pineapple, a little bit of peach, but there are also some yeasty notes coming through, a little bit of smoke even. On the palate, it's quite linear, quite fresh, quite vibrant. It only has 11% of alcohol, so it doesn't burn at all. It's quite fresh and long in the finish. I'm often not a big fan of those very aromatic wines, but this has exactly the right balance. It doesn't feel artificial, it's super aromatic, but there's also something else there. It's not just fruit flavors. There's also something else going on in the glass and it's fresh and vibrant on the palate. So I do like this. This again is an excellent wine. I rate this 93 points. It's really, really good. Delicious. The next one is the 2019 Heinrich Grauer Freiheit that retails for 35 US dollars. And you can't really say that natural wine producers are not creative with their packaging. This is like a clay bottle and it almost looks like the wine is sealed completely in clay. But on top there's a little wax layer and underneath I guess there's a cork. They actually ask you to shake the wine before opening it. I guess it's also a little bit cloudy and they want all of those bits and pieces to get into the glass together with the wine. Oh wow, look at that color. That's kind of special. This is another orange wine and this one really looks orange. It's a cuvee of Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, Pinot Gris and Neuburger and it was aged in barrels and amphora for 19 months. Stylistically this is very different to the previous orange wine. It's much more opulent, it smells like oranges and grapefruit and on the palate it's quite rich and concentrated with quite a lot of body. This is a very interesting wine, especially the color just jumps into your face. I'm not a big color person, I don't really care about color in wine. In this case, this really makes the wine stand out. Flavor and texture wise, it's also really well made. I think this is high end, very good. I would rate this 91 points. The next one is the 2020 Cheetah Himmel of Erden Rosé that retails for 30 US dollars. The wine is a cuvee of Cabernet Franc and Blaufränkisch and the label is an homage to a sculpture whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce here. Again, the wine is an interesting color. It's not your regular Côte de Provence Rosé color. It's more of a dark onion skin color, but it looks good. On the nose, the wine is quite neat and tidy. It smells of sour cherries. 
On the palette, it's fresh and vibrant. It's not 100% clean in my opinion. The finish is slightly weird. I would rate this 84 points. This is good. This is fun. It's interesting. It's different but it's not that complex. Next up, we have the 2020 Pusta Libre by Klaus Preisinger, which is again, a really a funky looking bottle. I don't know, why are natural wine producers so much focused on the shape and design of their bottles, if it's really all about the wine inside the bottle? But anyways, I'm getting distracted here. This looks pretty cool. It's kind of modeled like a Coca-Cola bottle from the 1950s. This is a cuvee of Zweigeld, St. Laurent and Pinot Noir, three red grape varieties that are planted fairly widely in Austria. Klaus Preisinger works biodynamically, uses minimal amounts of sulfites and he's done a really good job here. This is a very fresh and vibrant fruit forward wine. And I think at 13 US dollars, this is a really good deal. I would rate this 89 points. I would definitely prefer this to any Coca-Cola. And this is fun, this is good. It looks like Leon really likes Austria because this is the third Austrian natural wine. It's the 2020 Gut Ogau Anastasius, which retails for 30 US dollars and it's a cuvee of Blaufränkisch and Zweigeld. Gut Oga also got really creative with their labels. All of their wines have fictional characters associated to them. This is Anastasius, but the older characters are associated with the more expensive wines, while the younger characters are more, well, associated with the cheaper wines, I guess. Anastasius here is the son of Viltrude and Joshuari and the brother of Theodora whatever that means. The wine smells of blackberries and cherries. There's a little bit of a spicy peppery note coming through as well. It's very fruit driven, very fresh and vibrant. On the palate, it's juicy and fresh and lively. It's a really enjoyable, fresh and vibrant wine. Definitely pretty good. They are saying Anastasius can always be counted on, lusty and direct. He never hides his past, rooted in the gravel and the limestone of his homeland nor does he ever excuse his manner. Yeah, I think this is actually pretty good. I don't think that it is super profound, but I think it's it's really good. It's a really good wine. I, I would rate this 89 points as well. Juicy, fresh and vibrant, really good wine. Next up is the 2016 Savoumin Sous Roche from the domain Chassonny that retails for 60 US dollars and we are in Burgundy and I just realized that we didn't have three but four Austrian wines so now we are back in France. The founder of this domain Frédéric Cossin got into the wine business by accident. He did different jobs and then got really interested in wine and founded his winery in 1996 and now he's making wine from some really great vineyards in Burgundy. This is very profound and complex and very interesting because wine is dancing on knife's edge between flawed and amazing. It smells of cherries, blackberries, but there's also this delicate vinegar note in the background that comes through a little bit, but lifts up all of the flavor, all of the aroma. On the palate, it's juicy. The tannins are grippy, so there's quite a lot of structure there doesn't have the longest length, but it's an interesting wine. I mean, at 60 US dollars, it better should be an interesting wine, but this is really good. I mean, it's complex. Um, and I think this is a divisive wine in a way. I think people will have different opinions on this style of a wine. I happen to like it. I'm not super convinced that it's the best wine in the lineup so far, but it's certainly one of the most interesting ones and I would rate this 92 points. The last wine of the tasting comes from one of the more famous producers from the natural wine movement, Franco Nelison and his 2019 Susu Karu that retails for 25 US dollars and is from Sicily. He is certified organic and uses very small amounts of sulfites. He he is an interesting character. I actually visited his winery a few years ago and um, I really liked him and I really liked his style. And there's actually no capsule there, so no point in me cutting it. The wine is 85% Nerello Mascalese, which is a yeah, pretty
pretty widely grown grape variety in Sicily and the rest is just a mix of different grape varieties. What I found quite interesting when I visited him is that they are now using this cork. So a natural wine producer that actually uses a synthetic cork. Um, yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I found that a bit weird. This is more of an entry level wine. The vines for this wine are 50 years old on average. He distems the berries and then leaves the grape skins to macerate on the juice for roughly 30 days. The wine smells of plums, cherries, a little bit of black currant coming through as well. And you also have some black tea notes, a little bit of green pepper on the palate. It's quite juicy and fresh and vibrant. There's not a lot of tannins there. It's more, yeah, on the freshness, on the vibrancy. I would rate this 90 points. This is a really good wine, really enjoyable, but not the most profound wine that we've tasted today. This was a really interesting tasting. I haven't tasted this many great natural wines in a row. So that was a very good selection by Leon. I don't think that this is necessarily representative of all of the natural wines. This represents more of the best natural wines, but I was pleasantly surprised that there were very little flaws in those wines. They were really balanced. I mean, they were different, edgy, but not in a disgusting way. So <laughs> I really enjoyed them. All of them uh, were really good. The best ones for me was the first, the Taganan and um, I also really like the Matassa, definitely a great wine. But when it comes to the reds, I think it has to be the Suroche. That was really, really beautiful, great wine. But I can honestly recommend all of them if you want to try something a bit different, a bit weird, but beautiful. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, then please like it down here. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. My question of the day is obviously, what do you think about natural wines? Do you drink natural wines or not? Do you hate them? Do you love them? Please comment down below. I hope I see you guys again soon. Until then, stay thirsty.